Welcome back once again to our read aloud series for The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. We are ready to jump into part five. When we left off at the end of part four, the four children had reached Mr. and Mrs. Beaver's home. They'd had a wonderful dinner, which was very welcome considering how hungry all four of them were. And then Mr. Beaver and Mrs. Beaver started filling them in a little bit about the history of Narnia, the history of the White Witch, who Aslan was that they are going to meet, and why that there are four of them is so important with filling those four thrones at Care Paravel. That would be a sign of the end of the witch's power and of her life. And when we left off, they had noticed all of a sudden Edmund was gone. They had no idea where he was. They started to search, but then Mr. Beaver was like, we got to get out of here, because he already knew he had betrayed them to the White Witch. And now, of course, you want to know what had happened to Edmund. He had eaten his share of the dinner, but he hadn't really enjoyed it because he was thinking all the time about Turkish delight. And there's nothing that spoils the taste of good ordinary food half so much as the memory of bad magic food. And he had heard the conversation and hadn't enjoyed it much either, because he kept on thinking that the others were taking no notice of him and trying to give him the cold shoulder. They weren't, but he imagined it. And then he had listened until Mr. Beaver had told them about Aslan, and until he had heard the whole arrangement for meeting Aslan at the stone table. It was then that he began very quietly to edge himself under the curtain which hung over the door. For just the mention of Aslan gave him a mysterious and horrible feeling, just as it gave the others a mysterious and lovely feeling. Just as Mr. Beaver had been repeating the rhyme about Adam's flesh, Edmund had been very quietly turning the door handle. And just before Mr. Beaver had begun telling them that the White Witch wasn't really human at all, Edmund had gone outside into the snow and cautiously closed the door behind him. Now you mustn't think that even now Edmund was quite so bad that he actually wanted his brother and sisters turned into stone. He did want Turkish delight, and he did want to be a prince and later a king, and he did want to pay Peter back for calling him a beast. But as for what the witch would do with the others... He didn't want her to be particularly nice to them, certainly not to put them on the same level as himself, but he managed to believe, or at least he managed to pretend he believed, that she wouldn't do anything very bad to them. Because, he said to himself, all these people who say nasty things about her are her enemies and probably half of it isn't even true. She was jolly nice to me, anyway much nicer than they are. I expect she is the rightful queen, really. Anyway, she'll be better than that awful Aslan. At least that was the excuse he made in his own mind for what he was doing. It wasn't a very good excuse, however, for deep down inside him he really knew that the White Witch was bad and cruel. The first thing he realized when he got outside and found the snow falling all around him was that he had left his coat behind in the beaver's house. And, of course, there was no chance of going back to get it now. The next thing he realized was that the daylight was almost gone, for it had been nearly three o'clock when they sat down to dinner, and the winter days were short. He hadn't reckoned on this, but he had to make the best of it, so he turned up his collar and shuffled across the top of the dam. Luckily, it wasn't so slippery since the snow had fallen, and made his way to the far side of the river. It was pretty bad when he reached the far side. It was growing darker every minute, and what with that and the snowflakes swirling all around him, he could hardly see three feet ahead. And then, too, there was no road. He kept slipping into deep drifts of snow and skidding on frozen puddles and tripping over fallen tree trunks and sliding down steep banks and banging his shins against rocks till he was wet and cold and bruised all over. The silence and the loneliness were dreadful. In fact, I really think he might have given up the whole plan and gone back and owned up and made friends with the others again. If he hadn't happened to say to himself, when I'm king of Narnia, the first thing I shall do will be to make some decent roads. And, of course, that set him off thinking about being a king and all the other things he would do, and this cheered him up a good deal. He had just settled in his mind what sort of palace he would have, and how many cars, and about his private cinema, and where the principal railways would run, and what laws he would make against beavers and beaver dams, and was putting the finishing touches to some schemes for keeping Peter in his place, when the weather changed. First, the snow stopped. Then a wind sprang up and it became freezing cold. Finally, the clouds rolled away and the moon came out. It was a full moon, and shining on all that snow, it made everything almost as bright as day. Only the shadows were rather confusing. He never would have found his way if the moon hadn't come out, 
by the time he got to the other river. Perhaps you remember he had seen it when they first arrived at the Beavers, a smaller river flowing into the great one lower down. He now reached this and turned to follow it up, but the little valley down which it came was much steeper and rockier than the one he had just left, and so overgrown with bushes that he could not have managed it at all in the dark. Even as it was, he got wet through, for he had to stoop to go under branches, and great loads of snow came sliding off onto his back. And every time this happened, he thought more and more how he hated Peter, just as if all this had been Peter's fault somehow. But at last he came to a part where it was more level and the valley opened out, and there on the other side of the river, quite close to him really, in the middle of a little plain between two hills, he saw what must be the white witch's house. The moon was shining brighter than ever. The house was really a small castle. It seemed to be all towers, little towers with long pointed spires on them, sharp as needles. They looked like huge dunces' caps or sorcerers' caps, and they shone in the moonlight and their long shadows looked strange on the snow. Edmund was a bit afraid of the house. But at this point, it was too late to think of turning back now. He crossed the river on the ice and walked up to the house. There was nothing stirring, not the slightest sound anywhere. Even his own feet made no noise on the deep, newly fallen snow. He walked on and on, past corner after corner of the house, and past turret after turret to find the door. He had to go right round to the far side before he found it, it was a huge arch, but the great iron gates stood wide open. Edmund crept up to the arch and looked inside to the courtyard, and there he saw a sight that nearly made his heart stop beating. Just inside the gate, with the moonlight shining on it, stood an enormous lion, crouched as if it was ready to spring. Edmund stood in the shadow of the arch, afraid to go on, afraid to go back, his knees knocking together. He stood there so long that his teeth would have been chattering with cold, even if they had not been chattering with fear. How long this really lasted, I don't know, but it seemed to Edmund to last for hours. Then at last he began to wonder why the lion was standing so still, for it hadn't moved an inch since he first set eyes on it. Edmund now ventured a little nearer, still keeping in the shadow of the arch as much as he could. He now saw from the way the lion was standing it couldn't have been looking at him at all. But supposing it turns its head, thought Edmund. In fact, it was staring at something else, namely a little dwarf who stood with his back to it about four feet away. Ah, thought Edmund, when it springs at the dwarf, that'll be my chance to escape. But still the lion never moved, nor Edmund noticed the dwarf. And now at last Edmund remembered what the others had said about the white witch turning people into stone. Perhaps this was only a stone lion. And as soon as he had thought of that, he noticed the lion's back and the top of its head were covered with snow. Of course it must be only a statue. No living animal would have let itself get covered with snow in such a manner. Then very slowly, with his heart beating as if it would burst, Edmund ventured to go up to the lion. Even now he hardly dared to touch it. But at last he put out his hand, very quickly, and did. It was nothing but cold stone. He had been frightened of a mere statue. The relief which Edmund felt was so great that in spite of the cold, he suddenly got warm all over right down to his toes. And at the same time, there came into his head what seemed a perfectly lovely idea. Probably, he thought, this is the great lion Aslan they were all talking about. <laughs> She's caught him already and turned him into stone. So that's the end of all their fine ideas about him. <laughs> Who's afraid of Aslan? As he stood there gloating over the stone lion, Presently, he did something very silly and childish. He took a stump of lead pencil out of his pocket and scribbled a mustache on the lion's upper lip and a pair of spectacles on its eyes. Then he said, Yeah, silly old Aslan, how do you like being a stone? Thought yourself mighty fine, didn't you? But in spite of the scribbles on it, the face of the great stone beast still looked so terrible and sad yet noble, staring up in the moonlight so much so that Edmund didn't really get any fun out of jeering at it. He turned away and began to cross the courtyard. As he got into the middle of it, he saw that there were dozens of statues all about, standing here and there, rather as the pieces stand on a chessboard halfway through a game. There were stone satyrs and stone wolves and stone bears and foxes and mountain cats, all stone. There were lovely stone shapes that looked like women, but who were really the spirits of trees. There was the great shape of a centaur and a winged horse and a long, lithe creature that Edmund took to be a dragon. 
They all looked so strange, standing there perfectly lifelike, yet also perfectly still. In the bright, cold moonlight, it was eerie work crossing the courtyard. Right in the very middle stood a huge shape like a man, but as tall as a tree, with a fierce face and a shaggy beard and a great club in its right hand. Even though he knew that it was only a stone giant, not a live one, Edmund did not like going past it. He now saw that there was a dim light showing from a doorway on the far side of the courtyard. He went to it, and there was a flight of stone steps going up to an open door. Edmund went up them. Across the threshold lay a great wolf. It's all right. It's all right, Edmund kept saying to himself. It's only a stone wolf. Can't hurt me. And he raised his leg to step over it. Instantly, the huge creature rose with all the hair bristling along its back. It opened a great red mouth and said in a growling voice, Who's there? Who's there? Stand still, stranger, and tell me who you are. If you please, sir, said Edmund, trembling so that he could hardly speak. My name's Edmund. I'm the son of Adam that Her Majesty met in the woods the other day, and I've come to bring her the news that my brother and sisters are now in Narnia, quite close, in the beaver's house. She wanted to see them. I will tell Her Majesty, said the wolf. Meanwhile, stand still on the threshold as you value your life. Then it vanished into the house. Edmund stood and waited, his fingers aching with cold, his heart pounding in his chest. And presently the gray wolf, Fenris Ulf, the chief of the witch's secret police, came bounding back in and said, Come in, come in, fortunate favorite of the queen. Or else, not so fortunate. And Edmund went in, taking great care not to tread on the wolf's paws. He found himself in a long, gloomy hall with many pillars, full as the courtyard had been of statues. The one nearest the door was a little fawn with a very sad expression on its face. Edmund couldn't help wondering if this might have been Lucy's friend. The only light came from a single lamp, and close behind this sat the white witch. "'I've come, your majesty,' said Edmund, rushing eagerly forward. "'How dare you come alone!' said the witch in a terrible voice. "'Did I not tell you to bring the others with you?' "'Please, your majesty, I've done the best I can.' I brought them quite close. They're in a little river, or in a little house on top of the dam just up the river, with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. A slow, cruel smile came over the witch's face. Is this all your news? No, your majesty. And Edmund proceeded to tell her all he had heard before leaving the beaver's house. What? Aslan! Aslan! cried the queen. Is this true? If I find you have lied to me? Please... I'm only repeating what they said, stammered Edmund. But the queen was no longer attending to him. Clapped her hands. Instantly, the same dwarf whom Edmund had seen with her before appeared. Make ready our sleigh. And use the harness without bells. Now we must go back to Mr. and Mrs. Beaver and the three other children. As soon as Mr. Beaver said, There's no time to lose, everyone began bundling themselves into coats except Mrs. Beaver, who started picking up sacks and laying them on the table and said, Now, Mr. Beaver, just reach down that ham, and here's a packet of tea, and there's sugar and some matches, and if someone will get two or three loaves out of the crock over there in the corner. What are you doing, Mrs. Beaver? exclaimed Susan. Packing a load for each of us, dearie, said Mrs. Beaver very calmly. You didn't think we'd set out on a journey with nothing to eat, did you? But we haven't time, said Susan, buttoning the collar of her coat. She may be here any minute. That's what I say, chimed in Mr. Beaver. Oh, get along with both of you, said his wife. Think it over, Mr. Beaver. She can't be here for a quarter hour, of, quarter of an hour at least. But don't we want as big of a head start as we can possibly get, said Peter, if we're to reach the stone table before her? You've got to remember that, Mrs. Beaver, said Susan. As soon as she has looked in here and finds that we're gone, she'll be off at top speed. That she will, said Mrs. Beaver, but we can't get there before her, whatever we do, for she'll be on a sleigh and we'll be walking. Then are you saying we have no hope, said Susan. Oh, now don't you get fussing, there's a dear, said Mrs. Beaver. Just get half a dozen clean handkerchiefs out of that drawer. Of course we've got hope. We can't get there before her, but we can keep under cover and go by ways she won't expect and perhaps we'll get through. That's true enough, Mrs. Beaver, said her husband, but it's time we were out of this. Oh, and don't you start fussing either, Mr. Beaver, said his wife. There, that's better. There's four loads and the smallest for the smallest of us. That's you, my dear, she added, looking at Lucy. Oh, do please hurry, said Lucy. Well, I'm nearly ready now.
answered Mrs. Beaver, at last allowing her husband to help her into her snow boots. I suppose the sewing machine's probably too heavy to bring. Yes, it is, said Mr. Beaver. A great deal too heavy. You don't think you'll be able to use it while we're on the run, I suppose. Oh, I can't abide the thought of that witch fiddling with it. And breaking it or stealing it as likely as not, said Mrs. Beaver. Please, please do hurry, said all three children. And so at last they all got outside. Mr. Beaver locked the door. It'll delay her a little bit at least, he said. And they set off, all carrying their loads over their shoulders. The snow had stopped and the moon had come out when they began their journey. They went in single file. First Mr. Beaver, then Lucy, then Peter, then Susan, and Mrs. Beaver last of all. Mr. Beaver led them across the dam and onto the right bank of the river, and then along a very rough sort of path among the trees right down by the river bank. The sides of the valley shining in the moonlight towered up far above them on either hand. It's best to keep down here as much as possible, he said. She'll have to keep to the top, for you couldn't bring a sleigh down here. It would have been a pretty enough scene to look at through a window from a comfortable armchair. And even as things were, Lucy enjoyed it, at first. But as they went on walking, and walking, and walking, and as the sack she was carrying felt heavier and heavier and heavier, she began to wonder how she was going to keep up at all. And she stopped looking at the dazzling brightness of the frozen river with all its waterfalls of ice, and at the white masses of the treetops and the great glaring moon and the countless stars, and could only watch the little short legs of Mr. Beaver going pad, 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 pad through the snow in front of her. Then the moon disappeared, and the snow began to fall once more. And at last, Lucy was so tired that she was almost asleep and walking at the same time, when she suddenly found that Mr. Beaver had turned away from the river bank to the right, and was leading them steeply uphill into the very thickest bushes. And then, as she came fully awake, she found that Mr. Beaver was just vanishing into a little hole in the bank, which had been almost hidden under the bushes until you were quite on top of it. In fact, by the time she realized what was happening, only his short, flat tail was still showing. Lucy immediately stooped down and crawled in after him. Then she heard noises of scrambling and puffing and panting behind her, and in a moment, all five of them were inside. "'Wherever is this?' said Peter's voice, sounding tired and pale in the darkness. It's an old hiding place for beavers in bad times, said Mr. Beaver, and a great secret. It's not much of a place, but we must get a few hours sleep. If you hadn't all been in such a plaguey fuss when we were starting, I'd have brought some pillows, said Mrs. Beaver. It wasn't nearly such a nice cave as Mr. Tumnus's, Lucy thought, just a hole in the ground, but dry and earthy. It was very small, so that when they all lay down, they were all a bundle of fur and clothes together. And what with that and being warmed up by their long walk, they were really rather snug. If only the floor of the cave had been a little smoother. Then Mr. Beaver handed round in the dark a little flask out of which everyone drank something. It made one cough and splutter a little and stung the throat, but it also made you feel deliciously warm after you'd swallowed it, and everyone went straight to sleep. It seemed to Lucy only the next minute, though really it was hours and hours later when she woke up feeling a little cold and dreadfully stiff, thinking how she would like a hot bath. Then she felt a set of long whiskers tickling her cheek, and saw the cold daylight coming in through the mouth of the cave. But immediately after that she was very wide awake indeed, and so was everyone else. In fact, they were all sitting up with their mouths and eyes wide open, listening to a sound which was the very sound they'd all been thinking of, sometimes imagining they heard during their walk last night. It was a sound of jingling bells. Mr. Beaver was out of the cave like a flash the moment he heard it. Perhaps you think, as Lucy thought for a moment, that this was a very silly thing for him to do. But it was really a very sensible one. He knew he could scramble to the top of the bank among the bushes and brambles without being seen, and he wanted above all things to see which way the witch's sleigh went. The others all sat in the cave waiting and wondering. They waited nearly five minutes. Then they heard something that frightened them very much. They heard voices. Oh no, he's been seen, she's caught him, Lucy thought. Great was their surprise when a little later they heard Mr. Beaver's voice calling to them from just outside the cave. It's all right, he was shouting. Come out, Mrs. Beaver. Come out, sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. It's all right. It isn't her. This was bad grammar, of course, but that is how beavers talk when they are excited. I mean, in Narnia. In our world, they usually don't talk at all. 
So Mr. Be Mrs. Beaver and the children came bundling out of the cave, all blinking in the daylight, with your earth all over them, looking very frousty and unbrushed and uncombed with the sleep in their eyes. Come on, cried Mr. Beaver, who was almost dancing with delight. Come and see. This is a nasty knock for the witch. It looks as if her power is already crumbling. What do you mean, Mr. Beaver? panted Peter as they all scrambled up the steep bank of the valley together. Didn't I tell you? answered Mr. Beaver, that she'd made it always winter and never Christmas? Didn't I tell you? Well, just come and see. And then they were all at the top of the hill and did see. It was a sleigh, and it was reindeer with bells on their harness. But they were far bigger than the witch's reindeer, and they were not white but brown. And on the sleigh sat a person whom everyone knew the moment they set eyes on him. He was a huge man in a bright red robe, bright as holly berries, with a hood that had fur inside it and a great white beard that fell like a foamy waterfall over his chest. Everyone knew him because, though you see people of his sort only in Narnia, you do see pictures of them and hear them talked about even in our world, the world on this side of the wardrobe door. But when you really see them in Narnia, it's rather different. Some of the pictures of Father Christmas in our world make him look only funny and jolly, but now that the children actually stood looking at him, they didn't find it quite like that. He was so big and so glad and so real that they all became quite still. They felt very glad, but also solemn and calm. I've come at last, said he. She has kept me out for a long time, but I've got in at last. Aslan is on the move. The witch's magic is weakening. And Lucy felt running through her that deep shiver of gladness which you only get if you're being solemn and still. And now, said Father Christmas, for your presence, there is a new and better sewing machine for you, Mrs. Beaver. I'll drop it in your house as I pass. Oh, if you please, sir, said Mrs. Beaver, making a curtsy, but it's all locked up. <laughs> Locks and bolts make no difference to me, said Father Christmas. And as for you, Mr. Beaver, when you get home, you will find your dam finished and mended, with all the leaks stopped and a new gate fitted. Mr. Beaver was so pleased that he opened his mouth very wide, and then found he couldn't say anything at all. Peter, Adam's son. Here, sir, said Peter. These are your presents. And they are tools, not toys. The time to use them is perhaps near at hand. Bear them well. With these words, he handed to Peter a shield and a sword. The shield was the color of silver, and across it there ramped a red lion as bright as a ripe strawberry at the moment when you pick it. The hilt of the sword was of gold, and it had a sheath and a sword belt and everything it needed, and it was just the right size and weight for Peter to use. Peter was silent and solemn as he received these gifts, for he felt they were a very serious kind of present. Susan, Eve's daughter, said Father Christmas, these are for you. And he handed her a bow and a quiver full of arrows and a little ivory horn. You must use the bow only in great need, for I do not mean for you to fight in the battle. It does not easily miss, and when you put this horn to your lips and blow it, then wherever you are, I think help of some kind will come to you. Last of all, he said, Lucy, Eve's daughter. And Lucy came forward. He gave her a little bottle of what looked like glass, but people said afterwards that it was actually made of diamond and a small dagger. In this bottle, there is a cordial made of the juice of one of the fire flowers that grow in the mountains of the sun. If you or any of your friends are hurt, a few drops of this will restore you. And the dagger is to defend yourself at great need, for you also are not to be in the battle. Why, sir, I think, I don't know, said Lucy, but I think I could be brave enough. That is not the point. You are just not meant to be in this battle. And now, here he suddenly looked less grave and serious, here is something for the moment for you all. And he brought out, I suppose from the big bag at his back, but nobody quite saw him do it, a large tray containing five cups and saucers, a bowl of lump sugar, a jug of cream, and a great big teapot all sizzling and piping hot. Then he cried out, A Merry Christmas! Long live the true king! And cracked his whip. And he and the reindeer and the sleigh and all the rest were completely out of sight before anyone even realized they had started moving. 
Peter had just drawn his sword out of its sheath and was showing it to Mr. Beaver when Mrs. Beaver said, Now then, now then, don't stand talking there till the tea's gone cold. <laughs> just like men. Come help carry the tray down and we'll have breakfast. What a mercy I thought of bringing the bread knife. So down the steep bank they went and back to the cave, and Mr. Beaver cut some of the bread and ham into sandwiches, and Mrs. Beaver poured out the tea, and everyone enjoyed himself. But long before they had finished enjoying themselves, Mr. Beaver said, It's time to be moving on now. Which is where we will end for part five of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. As always, I hope you're enjoying the story so far. And be sure to join us back in a day or two for part six as we continue The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe.